And the title today is Lessons from Decapolis. Can we say it together? Dear Lord, you have started blessing us. Please enrich us once more. That in the speaking and in the receiving, our lives be blessed and their name be glorified in Jesus' name. The Decapolis crowd spent three whole days with our Lord and Master. And it was only on the third day that he offered them what to eat. Jesus only showed concern regarding their tummies as they were about to depart on the third day. So the big question is, couldn't he have fed them the first day? Could it be he lacked the power to provide food, to work out that miracle on the second day? Why did he withhold his compassion until the last minute when they were about to depart or disperse on the third day? Listen to the first lesson. I think I'm going to deal just with the first lesson today. It was a historical event. And this is the first lesson we learn from it. Priority is the key word here. No matter what I say today, don't let go of the word priority. Jesus prioritized their spirit over their flesh. He prioritized their spiritual needs over their material needs. He prioritized kingdom concerns over material needs. Matthew 6, 33 reads, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. The kingdom of God first concept is a biblical truth and policy. The late Dr. Maurice Sorolo always says, hardly will you hear that man preach or teach without saying all truths are parallel. At the point of our salvation, it was our spirits that was born again and transformed. And that is a basic truth and issues priority. I don't know if you have noticed or if you have read in between lines. When our spirit got born again, our flesh did not go did not get born again. It was only the spirit. The flesh is still the old man. The flesh is still, I don't know what to call it. It is only at rapture when we'll be taken into the presence of our God that transformation will take place. And we are told then, this corruptible, in other words, now our flesh is corruptible. First Corinthians 15, 53 said, this corruptible shall put on incorruptibility. 
In other words, the flesh we carry now is corruptible. It hasn't been born again like the spirit. The salvation of the flesh and the transformation, it's being born again, will wait until we are about to zoom into heaven on the last day. And it confirms what Dr. Maurice Sorulu is always saying. All truths are, parable, are parallel. That Jesus decided to give attention to the spirit of these people for three days. And it was at the end he decided to attend to their flesh. And that the same truth says Seek first the kingdom of God. That is number one. Then, after that, these other things shall be added to you. Jesus said again, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The flesh is weak. Does it mean the flesh is tired? No. The flesh lacks determination. It lacks willpower. It falters. And when you're somebody faltering, it's a very serious weakness. You can't take your stand. So the flesh is just like that. But as for the spirit, the spirit wants to do something. The, the flesh is always betraying and sabotaging the spirit. The flesh is always messing up. Even when the spirit is willing to stand for God, the flesh falters. It misbehaves because it is weak. So Jesus wanted the Capolis problem of hunger to wait. He wanted to fortify the spirit first. And then at the end, attention will be given to the flesh. Don't lose sight of this. Our spirit lives in the flesh. So we have a problem here. Our born again spirit is living in our crazy non-born again body. Therefore, there is a conflict. Very big conflict. Galatians 5, 17, NIV has this to say. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. And the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. That means we are all suffering from what medical science calls split personality Disorder or syndrome. Split personality disorder or syndrome. If you are suffering from split personality syndrome, you see the same person, this time he is kind. The next minute he's a killer. He can act this way and act this way. So it's like two different human beings living in one body. And for this reason, we often see good people doing bad things. Have you seen a good person do bad things before? Somebody very good. And he, he gets out of the way and does something that baffles you. You begin to wonder, now you mean this person did this? Yeah. Two forces are inside. And there is a kind of interplay. 
early 70s when I came here. Perhaps I hadn't spent up to a year. A brother who was living on the outskirts of this city, but was always attending our fellowship. It was a non-denominational fellowship. He visited me one morning. I looked at his eyes. They were red. He had cried and cried and cried. Immediately he wanted to tell his story. He started crying again. I said, bro, what happened? Why are you weeping? He told his story. He was selling, I think, fancy materials. And there was this woman who used to bring him the fabrics all the way from Lagos. Unfortunately for him, the relationship has been very intimate, but not romantic. He had even shown, taken her to where he lived. In case he arrived with, you know, something to supply. In those days, where did you find phones? So that she could get in touch directly. So this lady came to the shop delivered all the goods, business completed, and she had other people to supply. Late at night, she surfaced. Yeah, she finished and went to the relative where she normally passed the night. The door was locked. Everybody, had, everybody said he had traveled. She was stranded and had no place to pass the night. My good brother believed he was a very strong guy. Sister, what can I do for you? Not even sister, she wasn't a Christian. In the end, she said, no problem. Because he was complaining, my bed is a small bed. And finally, no, I can sleep on the floor. The brother said, no, I will sleep on the floor. My holy brother you know, gave her water to take her bath, this and that, food, and he put mat on the floor. Perhaps they prayed a little prayer. In the night, she got up. Before morning, signs and wonders happened. Brother couldn't believe he was the one that did this thing. He cried and cried, then finally took off. I must go to the evangelist. I'm in hell already. I was the one begging him. It has happened. Your mistake was that you overcessed yourself. Now forgive yourself. And I spent time ministering to him and, in, and assuring him that his name had not been blotted out from the book of life. So there is this conflict we have in us and it demands that we help our poor spirit against our terrible flesh that is always trying to put us into trouble. So how did Paul handle this conflict or crucible? 1 Corinthians 9, 27, from easy to read version of the Bible. I don't know how many of you who have easy to read. It says, it is my own body. I fight to make it do what I want. It is my own body. This body belongs to me. So I fight to make it do what I want. I do this so that I won't miss getting the prize myself after telling others about it. After I've told others about the glories of heaven, about the crown of righteousness, about how we'll be welcomed about the great feast which God will set up 
for his son as the bridegroom and the church as his bride. After I've told people all this, I don't want to miss it myself. Hallelujah. Matthew 6, that's a tray, commands. Seek first the kingdom. And Romans 14, 17 says, in King James Version, that that kingdom is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So preference must be given to the spirit. Do everything to fortify your spirit. And John 6, 63 says, It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. And may I add, comparatively, the flesh profits nothing. Don't take it as a straightforward statement. The flesh profits nothing. No. The flesh profits. Because if, if this flesh drops, the spirit is like a coward. It will just run off, go to present itself before God. So the flesh is profitable. That is the tabernacle, my earthly tabernacle, as the Bible describes it. But in comparison, the spirit is superior. And in comparison, this flesh is useless. It profits nothing. We can push the concept of the flesh profits nothing to the extreme. We can take it overboard. Some people have killed themselves. Christians, as a result, they saw the flesh as a terrible enemy and they decided, I'm going to deal with this flesh because I love heaven, I love God, I love Jesus, and I want to go to heaven. This flesh, I'll deal with you. In the early church, after the apostles had died, and another generation took over, church history tells us Christians, many Christians did the unbelievable. In their beads, to pursuing righteousness. Many extra biblical measures were taken against the flesh, which they believed profits nothing. We don't take certain words very literally. Some people wanted to subdue the flesh, pomel the flesh, and all that that some people will get up in the night in very cold countries, go and stand in icy river. Stand in icy river. Until their bones are aching, they are almost dying. This is just to punish the flesh, then they will step out. When they get better, they go back. And somebody will be doing this throughout the night, to mortify the flesh, to subdue it, and to make it obedient. A good number of brothers, ask Reverend Adegoye, as a theologian, he'll tell you, a few brothers castrated themselves. Somebody cut off his manhood. Was it Polycap or who? Yeah. Because they want to deal with this thing. They don't want to go to hellfire. Some people had specific time when they flogged themselves. Use cord and continue beating themselves up. Because the flesh will need to be punished. Some people fasted until they died. I was studying this last night. They mentioned one, St. Katrina or so. She fasted until she died because she didn't want the flesh to rule her. 
many people decided I'm going to sleep on the floor throughout this year. I'm not going to lie on mattress. That is a way of formelling the body. But this castration seemed to be the most severe to me. And the brothers who did this, I see as weak brothers. Because they were so scared that if I keep my manhood, I'm not sure I'm going to survive. This thing would definitely lead me to hellfire. So I'm afraid it's going to overpower. So let me deal with it in this way. Early 70s when I got here, I was still a bachelor. He was a brother. He was going to the oldest Pentecostal church I met here. Of course, they were on life support. It was when I came and held the first crusade, second crusade, that people knew that that there was something like Pentecostalism. So he belonged to that church. From time to time, we come to our fellowship. He left the wife in the east and came over here trying to establish because the war had just ended so that he'll bring the wife and children here. But at the point, he was so full of lust and he was sure he was going to heaven because of evil thoughts and things happening in his body. And one day, he bought the hottest type of pepper, ground it very well, stripped himself, anointed himself with it, and sat there. Yes, make it a penny, make it a burn you. Now you want carry me, go ahead. <laughs> and he shared the testimony as a very wonderful thing he did. But let me tell you, that is not where you should deal with. You deal with here. It is here. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Do you carry hot iron? And you say, this mouth, you do the talk. You carry hot iron and put on your lips so that you stop yourself from talking. No. You deal with here. And Steve told us, Pastor Steve told us, when you hear hearts that way, it's not your mechanical heart, it's the mind. That's where. Abundance of thoughts generate, you know, what the mouth will say. Of a truth, our spirit was born again. Our spirit was transformed during our salvation experience. But our flesh awaits its salvation and transformation at the point of rapture. So priority must be given to the spirit first. Take care of the spirit man. And things will be okay for you. A pastor was preparing Saturday evening. The wife had gone to women's fellowship. This thing happened, I think, in the United States. And left their son. And the son wouldn't allow the father to concentrate. And the father was thinking, what do I do so that I'll get this boy's attention off me? So that I can prepare my sermon. I'm I'm running out of time. Of course, those are the people who wait until Saturday. I don't wait. By Monday, if I don't know what I'm going to preach on Sunday, I'm restless. So as the boy continued to disturb him, he saw a newspaper lying down. It had a map of the world. And he picked it up, called his son by the name. He tore it into pieces. He showed him first then tore it into pieces. He says, son, have this solo tape. I want you to piece the map of the world together and solo tape it. I want Africa to be in the position of Africa, not America, 
South America, Asia, and all that. And this little boy started the walk. And it was difficult. Then he turned the whole thing upside down and saw the picture of a man right behind it. Oh. So he decided to face the man. Fixing the hands, the legs, the head, everything. Celotaped it, turned it right side up. It was the picture of the world. He said, Dad, I'm true. No, 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 you are not correct. It's incorrect. When he looked at it, everything was in its place. He asked him, son, how did you do it? He said, dad, I saw a man behind the world. And when I took care of the man, the world took care of itself. Hallelujah. The pastor said, eh? That is my topic tomorrow. <laughs> Hallelujah. That is how it goes. If you take care of the spirit, the flesh will take care of itself. But we do the opposite. The best food we find is for the flesh. The best clothing we buy is for the flesh. The body cream we buy is for who? The flesh. The hair cream we buy is for who? The flesh. Jewels you buy, who wears it? The flesh is not your spirit. The shoes we wear, who owns it? The flesh. Blood tonic women drink. Where does it go to? Vitamin supplements for the flesh. Nail polish for the flesh. The bra for the flesh. Lip balm and li or lipstick. Where? It belongs to the flesh. All the makeups for the flesh. Go to some women's dressing table and see things there. You become confused. How can this woman know what all these bottles and cups and how can you ever determine which one is for what? And all that that fills the table is for who? The flesh. Now, how much do we do for the spirit? How much? What do we give to the spirit when we spend all this money, all this time and resources preparing, decorating and beautifying the flesh? So may I ask you this question? Why are you leaving the spirit unsupported and you are giving all the support to the bad guy the flesh. What did the spirit do to you? Is it not your spirit that will take you to heaven? When will you give attention to your spirit? Have you seen how much we beg you to come for weekly activities? It is in weekly activities we learn. We learn. When we come for such things. Now, if I have the power to rip off all the flesh here today, and if I am able to expose our spirits, and we see your spirit sitting here without flesh, my goodness, you will see skeletons seated on it. We are going to run. It will just be our spiritual skeleton sitting here. Looking so frightening. But it is only the flesh we have on top that is making us look normal. But if we look at the spirit this morning, if, there's, if there is any, any device we can use to survey the spirit of the people seated here this Sunday morning, many you will run. All of us will be running to find our ways out. May God deliver us 
in Jesus' name. So number one lesson which we learn from Decapolis is that attention be given first and foremost to the spirit man. And how do we do it? We must learn to feed on God's word. Look at God himself telling Joshua what to do. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. This book, mind you, Joshua, Moses had died and Joshua was taking over and God was giving him the key to success and that's why God was telling him this do not be afraid I will be with you as I was with my servant Moses so shall I be with you but that I'm with you does not negate the fact that there are a few things you need to do and this was the number one instruction Joshua 1 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. If I begin to ask now, how many people here read their Bible on their own? throughout last week? And how many times did you read the Bible throughout last week? We'll be ashamed if we can be truthful here today. We raise our hands and you see the people that never touched the Bible on their own throughout last week. You'll be so ashamed that they call themselves Christians. But God said to Joshua, it must not depart from your mouth. As new converts, that's the first thing they taught us. You get up every morning, you read a chapter or two. I wasn't just reading a chapter or two. I was reading more than that. And then I would do cramming. Find passages, cram them, recite them over and over. I had my friend, God even in it. We begin to do competition. You quote Galatians 5.17. Yeah, the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? This adultery. But blah, 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 blah. Then I give him, he will recite. And we crammed the Bible. Crammed, crammed, crammed. Read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. One brother here one day told me, he says, sir, I am amazed. How do you know these Bible passages? <laughs> and I was looking at him. It's by reading. There was no button that I pressed and immediately they were downloaded into me. No. Read, cram, internalize it. And the thing is, even when you have lost it, you can't remember where it is like now. I hardly can remember where which is. But because I know that scripture, thank God Google had made it very easy. You mean like press few words, Google Pits pulls up the passage. And that's how we put it together and preach to you. Hallelujah. Proverbs 27, verse 17, tells us that iron sharpens iron. We learn from one another. I haven't finished my preaching, but you've learned a few things from me today. If you want to be fair to me. We've learned a few things. Hebrews 10, 25 reads, And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Don't stop coming to fellowship. There are people in the church who have formed the habit. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. You see, the man, that is the manner, the character, the routine of some people. You don't see them in regular meetings. You see them only on Sundays. The writer of the book of Hebrews said, don't do that. But let us continue assembling ourselves together. Because we know that the coming of the Lord is nearer. 
And of course, we are told what will go with the coming of the Lord. This day shall be evil. And it is when we come together to encourage one another, that is when we learn and we enhance our coping mechanism. Fasting and prayer can be very good for your spirit. I'm now telling you things, nuggets, I'm giving to you. When you fast and pray, not just month of prayer, you decide which day of the week can I dedicate and forget food and it's from morning until evening. Spend time. Not talking to even anybody. Let me talk with God. Let me just be with my maker in that day. Read the Bible. Pray. Talk to him. If there are weaknesses, you've been fighting, you present it again. You advise, you counsel yourself. By the time you finish, you discover you are better for it. Hallelujah. Read good books. I don't keep my mind porous. The worst thing I hate in this life is to go to somebody's office and I'm sitting down. You pick up magazines there, they contain nothing. So in those days, when I have need of going to anybody's office, where I'll be made to sit down, I go with an interesting book. And I'll be reading. I don't sit idle on the plane. Sometimes we travel for 14 hours. I just sit in there. I carry my book. The last pilgrimage I made to Israel, I made it with my wife. And we are returning. From Israel to Turkey, I was reading and preparing sermon because there is something like a table. We stopped at Turkey, changed plane. Nearly we took off. I'm writing. If I finish this sermon, I write another one. Most of the messages I preach to you here, really, if you know what times. Like last night, I was up after one. And I rehearsed and tweaked this sermon I'm preaching for about two hours, two and a half hours. Then I knelt down. I started praying. I prayed and prayed and prayed before going back to bed around 4 a.m. So when most of you are sleeping, I'm up. So I don't ever keep my mind burros running up and no. Thank God today you can read anything on your phone. Any topic. Scientific. Disease. Human behavior. The other day I was telling you what developmental psychologists said about different stages of life. I read it. From here. Anything you press, you get it. So I don't need to carry books about. Some of you, you play a game. I've never learned how to play any game. I refuse because that thing can be addictive. Spend time playing game on your phone. When will you do useful things? I'd rather read. That is my university. You know, I didn't go to any university. How many of you know? I didn't go. It is reading, personal development, research everything, know whatever you can know. And when I stand with those who claim to know, they can't confound me. Shout hallelujah. <laughs> so that's what I do. Paul said, this one thing I do. This is what I do. Hallelujah. What of your thoughts? If you leave your mind porous, it will go here and go there. So we must practice mind control. A female passes and Satan starts analyzing her. Stop and change. Change gear 
And look at what Paul told the Philippians. Chapter 4, verse 8. It reads, New Living Translation. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Hallelujah. Avoid pornography. Avoid it. Don't come and tell pastor to pray for you. You are lost in You don't when you feed the flesh with rubbish. Your thoughts are occupied by rubbish. Tell me, why will you not become an agent of Satan? Why wouldn't you be disgraced? Why wouldn't you find yourself in this type of mess? When you're feeding yourself with rubbish. How can you be a normal human being? After storing all these things, your body is asking for it. If you're not careful. Practice giving. No matter how small. When you give, it has a way of lifting your spirit and making you feel good. So be a giver. No matter how, how little, try to give somebody something. Hallelujah. Be like the Capolis people. Value the spiritual. They never complained. They never complained. They just sat down. Receiving, drinking from the fountain Christ came with for three whole days. And Jesus knowing the spirit is more important. He wanted to fortify their spirit. Taking care of the spirit so that the flesh can take care of itself. Shall we rise up this? Hallelujah.